This is a sea star called the Sun Star, or Pycnopodia. It actually has 25 arms, so you normally think of sea stars as having five arms. This one has 22 to 25, a variable number really. And these guys book. Compared to other sea stars, these guys can really move quickly because they have tube feet. There's tube feet on the bottom that allow them to move very quickly. And in fact, when a Pycnopodia is moving into a, um, a tide pool, if there are sea urchins in that tide pool, they begin to take off as well, too. They start a, a stampede, so to speak. Now, all this kind of happens in slow motion, but for the sea star and for the uh, sea urchins, it's really rapid motion. These are voracious predators, uh, and, and what we call, in some cases, a keystone predator in the rocky intertidal. Again, pointing out some of the diversity of life that we find in the ocean. I didn't point out that these are members of the class Asteroidea and the phylum Echinodermata, which means spiny skin. Here's another Echinoderm. This is a bat star, a relative of the 25-legged uh, Pycnopodia. This is your more common sea star that you find, uh, um, on again, on the seashore or living anywhere throughout the world ocean. Another Echinoderm. This one in the class Echinoidea is the sea urchin. This is a purple sea urchin, Strongylocentrotus purpuratus. Uh, this is one that we saw down in Baja, and you see that it has a very spiny skin. As we move ever to more complex organisms, we move into the phylum Chordata. Now, that's our phylum, right? And this organism, which kind of looks like a sponge but isn't, is one of our relatives. And I know that's kind of hard to believe, although maybe you've had relatives that look like this. But this is a sea squirt. This is a colonial sea squirt. They have an opening, both uh, a in-current and ex-current siphon. They have a very complicated life history, even though their organisms themselves are very similar. So here's a case where we go to the development of the egg and what goes on in the egg prior to maturation to an adult that tells us sort of uh, the, the sequence of events um, in the evolution of life, but tells us something about the relatedness of this organism to other organisms. And one of the things that's notable about this organism is that it produces a notochord. Now, we'll talk about that in just a moment, but here's another sea squirt. And 80% of the genes, so 80% of the genetic code that we find in these guys can be found in humans as well. So that pretty much seals the deal that they're related to us, more related to us than other organisms. And here's why at, in the development of the embryo, um, we find very similar types of development and in this stage here, this tadpole stage, we find what's called a notochord. And it's that notochord that in us becomes a spinal cord. It degenerates in the sea squirt and it just becomes a benthic organism that lives on the seafloor. Again, it's not always apparent who your relatives are, but when we look at the genetic code, when we look at the developmental features, we can see similarities between these organisms, these sea squirts, and us. Here's another type of chordate. These are colonial salps, and these are, a, again, a, a type of gelatinous plankton. These happen to form chains. Each one of these is an individual salp, and you can see they're longer than a person. In fact, some of these get to be about half the length of a football field, floating through the ocean, filtering out plankton, and in some cases, when they bloom in, in extreme and profusion, they can become a nuisance in the sense of clogging up people's uh, fishermen's nets and those kinds of things. But normally, they're a kind of organism that performs an important role in marine ecosystems and pelagic ecosystems by being that link again between phytoplankton and higher organisms. These are another type of uh, predator in the ocean. 